I know we were talking about corpus selecti and the kind of different definitions that come up with corpus selecti, uh, the convergences that we need in order to, to create that body of the crime. We had a couple different definitions that we used uh, to create a crime. One had two elements and one had four. I'll start with the easier of the two. We said we need uh, some sort of criminal act. And what was the other half that needs to converge? Person. Right, some sort of person or a person uh, to be responsible for that act, to cause that act was a term we came up later in the class. Uh, we're going to go into that just a little bit more uh, in review today. But uh, the person responsible for that criminal act has to cause that criminal act. Uh, those two converge into making a crime. Uh, So going into the four-pronged approach of crime, causation is the first one. We have to have some sort of illegality, a crime to, to break, a, a broken, or excuse me, a codified crime. But uh, there's another term we used. Principle of analogy. Right, that, that is the, exactly right, that, that is the, the crime, the codified crime, something something written down that you have to break. Uh, in general, they say, uh, which isn't always true, but they say no victim, no crime. So somebody has to be harmed or injured. We're going to talk about that idea of victimless crime and uh, how it's not necessarily always true. But so we have a causation, harm, a principle of legality or some, some sort of uh, codified uh, law that was broken. And usually, some sort of a necessary uh, increased attendant of of that crime. So uh, they call it necessary attendant circumstances. We're going to talk about the the definition of that. But if you see those four, uh, that is going to be the four prong approach of realizing what the body of a, of a crime is. Uh, the corpus left that crime creating crime. So we talk about causation. <sighs> Give me. Give me a simple example. We'll go on the side. Of the room here. Start on the side again. Uh, a simple example of somebody causing a crime or committing a crime. Any, anything. Anything. If you're going to, we use arson. So if we were going to commit arson, or you had a suspect who's commit, going to commit arson, what do they need to do to cause that crime to occur? Start a fire. Start a fire. Right. They need to start a fire, and that fire has to. How do we define a harm or an injury in that fire? Literally, somebody can get hurt. Uh, what if you're not home? Can you still be injured or harmed? Yeah. In what way? Right. Losing losing your property is is a harm to you. So we fall into that that uh, that second portion. So proximate cause. Um, so how many, do you remember, tell me a little bit about proximate cause. How many review that? So if you're not the direct cause, we use an example of the air conditioner, I believe, last, last or a couple days ago. Or uh, I'm trying to remember, also we talked about transferred intent in some way. It was transferred intent. Now, how did that come into play? I'm sorry? Oh, we talked about, the, we used the example of the air conditioner shooting a gun with the air conditioner coming on, and we also talked about transfer intent. Do you, do you remember what the, how we talked about proximate cause, but what, what a, so we have a direct cause. If I, if I shoot somebody in this chair, I'm the direct cause. But there are a lot of things that could influence that somebody getting hurt. We, uh, I think one of the examples we use, if I shoot through this window, is that inherently dangerous? Can we can we assume that that's, that somebody could get hurt? Would be doing that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody outside screams. That causes somebody in this classroom to stand up while I'm shooting through the window, and then they get hit. Did I initially have the intent to shoot somebody in this classroom? No. No. Not in this story. But did I cause that? Yes. But didn't the person outside cause it also? Yes. Okay. 
So these these ancillary causes of how we, we talk about there is a proximate cause. It could be um, and usually the first of that string of motions mm -hmm. is what would be the cause. Usually, I wouldn't bank on that all the time, but it's a it's a good bet. So if you have a, a string of motions or a string of uh, events placed in motion, usually that first thing that me shooting through the window was the first thing that caused it. There were a lot of other things that caused it because even if uh, even if the person outside screaming had nothing to do with me shooting, maybe they were screaming because they saw a mouse, but there was just a string of things that happened. But you need to remember, and this is moving on to, to some new territory here. The idea has to be the initial cause that, uh, but for, we call it the but for rule. You know, it, 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 or excuse me, uh, it, if not for the fact that I had been shooting through that window, nobody would have hurt. But what about, uh, I'll use the example from the book. Somebody gets, uh, somebody gets into a fight with somebody else inside a house and they, they go to punch him in the face. I want to get punched in the face, so our victim runs outside. The suspect chases the victim outside into a thunderstorm, and they get struck by lightning. What is the cause? Do we have a problem? Do we have a did did our suspect cause the murder and, and the person died from lightning strike? No. Did our suspect cause the murder because of that, that that initial first line of string of events? No, I found that out the hard way. You got struck by lightning. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, on one of those questions, you know. So yeah. he actually didn't cause him to get struck by light. Right. Although he, he started the string of events. Yeah. Yeah. So he's not criminally, not necessarily criminally liable for that debt. And let's walk our way through that. How come they wouldn't use that? That, 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 that threw me off. Um, why wouldn't they use that but for? Mm -hmm. Him um, chasing him, he put a man outside. And that's the well, why'd you ask that question? <laughs> You're gonna make me earn my paycheck. <laughs> I don't get paid. This is all volunteer work. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go back to the initial example so I can do a compare and contrast. The uh, initial example that we used is I was shooting through the the window. Somebody saw a mouse outside, they screamed. For some reason, the gunfire didn't surprise anybody, but the screaming did surprise them. So they pop up to see why somebody's screaming, and then they get hit. We agree that that is a dangerous proposition for me to shoot through that window. I can reasonably assume that somebody could get hurt if I'm doing that. And then in the end, somebody did get hurt in this story. However, uh, if I have beef with somebody in my home and we decided to duke it out, and I go to punch them in the face, is there a reasonable likelihood that when I punch them in the face, they're gonna get struck by lightning? Yeah. Inside my house, no. Mm -hmm. It's not reasonable to assume. In this story, it did happen. There's an unreasonable uh, conclusion, but I had reasonable expectations. What, what were my reasonable expectations if I had tried to punch them in the face? To harm you? Yeah, I, I thought I was gonna harm them, right? Uh, it was reasonable to assume that we were going to get into a fight, Maybe it was reasonable to assume that if I punch them in the face, they could fall back and hit their head on the coffee table. We can make a, a ton of reasonable assumptions like that. We could assume that maybe if I punch them in the face and they get a bloody nose and they have some sort of blood disorder that can't stop their bleeding, they could maybe die from something like that. That's a it's a stretch, but there is it's within the realm of reasonability to assume that any of these bad things, any of these harms could happen if I punch someone in the face in my home. But it is unreasonable to most people to believe that I, if I punch you in the face, I'm going to create lightning and cause you to be struck by that lightning. Oh, so there has to be a nexus between a nexus being, being connection. There has to be a nexus between what I reasonably intended or thought would happen would, would be a result of my actions and those end result actions. So because about assumptions here, so they not in 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 court, they not on home on assumptions. That's all. There are assumptions, but they have to be reasonable assumptions. A lot of what the law talks about is what a reasonable person will believe. I know we talked about uh, last week, week before we talked about uh, being able to detain somebody. Uh, when a law, uh, when a peace officer can detain somebody, they have to have what's called reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion we defined as a set of articulable facts that a reasonable person will believe 
would lead you, or that a reasonable person would believe would lead to uh, the, the person to be detained is either committing a crime, about to commit a crime, or has committed a crime. So that, that's how we define that. But it has to be a reasonable person. We can't just make up all kinds of crazy facts and say, hey, I saw that guy walking by the criminal justice, the public safety building. Uh, I think, it, you know, I think what he's going to do is set fire to the deli across the street. Like, there's, there's no reasonable connection. There has to be that reasonable belief. You can't just come up with any old facts and say that that's why I want to detain you. So the law really depends on that doctrine of reasonability. So in this scenario, I think we came to an agreement, uh, but I'm always open to, to dissenting views. That is, it is reasonable to believe that if I start firing a gun in the classroom in any direction, it could result in somebody getting shot in this confined space, regardless of what direction I shoot. Even if I shoot into the ceiling, how would it be reasonable if I, if I was shooting into the ceiling that, that somebody could be harmed? Ricochet, yeah, bullet has to come back down. Ricochet, it could be uh, because harm doesn't always have to come from the actual bullet itself, right? What about fragments from the ceiling or the the, the portion, the hard portion of the ceiling? The ceiling can fall. Yeah, we can hit the uh, the projector. There are a ton of reasonable assumptions to, that would lead us to believe that it's just not a good idea to shoot a gun in this classroom, and that's why I hardly ever do it. So we have to, now going back to that story about the lightning, we said there are a ton of reasonable things that we can expect from, from that battery, I think we call it battery and assault, something along those lines, that fight. Uh, we have reasonable assumptions to lead us to believe that there will be bad outcomes to that fight, but the idea that that person was going to uh, get struck by lightning, it's just not one of those reasonable assumptions. What about, if I go to assault this person and they run outside and trip over the door and fall and break their neck. Is that more reasonable than the lightning? Sure. I think it's a gray area, but I would definitely be willing to listen to some arguments where that was a proximate cause and actual, where somebody could be held legally, uh, or excuse me, criminally liable for that death if they fell and broke their neck and died. Whereas running outside and getting struck by lightning, there's just no way to connect those two those two dots reasonably, and we have to just really remember that word reasonably. And who did that rely on a judge or jury or you know because it's it's, it's on who's really the wide it's really broad yeah. you know it depends on who's making the decision so it depends on what level of the investigation so it would depend on initially the investigator. If they're going to have a reasonable belief to detain you and then a probable cause, you know, have to believe they have probable cause to, to make an arrest. Then the reasonability, the burden of reasonability falls on the shoulders of the prosecutor to decide whether or not they're going to file a case. After that, it's on the jury. The jury has to believe, okay, was there a reasonable nexus to, to this action versus this uh, result? And how are they going to know to make that connection? I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, the arguments and then the final thing is right before they, they go to deliberate, we have jury instructions that tell them this is what the law says. This is how we connect the dots legally. It has to be a reasonable expectation. And they'll be told what reasonability is, the legal definition of reasonability. And they'll be told that you can't use an example of, uh, they may even use an example of lightning or something like that to give it a non-example of reasonability. Uh, with regard to the but for rule. So we talk about actions immediately causing a death. Let, let's, let's expand that definition a little bit. What if we, and we'll stipulate in this case, I cause, um, what, uh, we'll go with shooting. The same, same guy that was in my house that got struck by lightning, now he's gonna get shot because he's having a really bad day. We're, not, we're having an argument in my house. I pull out a gun and I unlawfully shoot him. No doubt, stipulate that I unlawfully shot him. No self-defense in this. He gets shot in the chest and goes to the hospital and goes into a call. Doesn't die. What can I be charged? What, what am I criminally liable for? 
I'm sorry? Attempted murder? Sure. Attempted murder. Um, some sort of unlawful assault on, on this guy. Was it reasonable for uh, for me to assume that if I shot him, the harm would come to him? Yeah. yeah. So I had a criminal action, and there was somebody to blame, me. Mm -hmm. So we have a crime. I caused that crime, or that, that harm. So what can I reasonably expect to be done after that by the police? Be arrested. Sure. <laughs> be arrested. Do you think that's a fileable case? Do you think the prosecutor's going to prosecute that case? Since, we, since I gave you the fact pattern, or there's no self-defense. And so, I, and then is it reasonable to believe that I'm going to be convicted of the, we'll call it a temper? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So all of that takes about three months. And then the gentleman in the hospital because of all the, uh, the trauma to his chest, the, the fluids in his chest, his heart uh, gives out, he has a heart attack, and he dies in his hospital bed three months later. I'm charged with murder. Did I cause the, yeah. did I cause his death? Yes. In what way? Can, tell me how I caused his death. Give me that string of events that we talked about, the shoot string of events. Him. So I started out with said shoot him. Mm -hmm. Then what? Um, he ran off the door. Not this <laughs> he just fell out when I shot him. Okay. Went to a coma. Went to a coma. Okay. Had, probably had some chest. I think we said he got shot in the chest, so had some chest trauma. Injuries. Oh. Harm. So we have two. We've used harm a couple different ways. Harm being one of the legal definition of harm, and then we have the literal, literal medical. Like there is literal harm to his chest as well. So there's harm to his chest, and then that harm eventually caused what? Okay, so that string of events. Can I be put at the head of that string of events uh, to meet the definition of the but for rule? I think so. So, how long? Like, what if that that bullet causes trauma to his chest? He lives for the next thirty years. Gets an infection in that that same wound. He's been he's been treating that wound for thirty years. He's always got to get a always got to get medical treatment, and then the the finally just the the weight of having to always get the treatment to his chest that from that one bullet, nothing else. The only only injury he's had to his chest is the one bullet that I gave him, and eventually thirty years later, uh, Joey here. I don't think so. And you've been tried already for. Wasn't I tried the first time? Yeah. Well, I said as long as you've been tried. Mm -hmm. For the first, for the first incident, you can't be tried again when you die. But wasn't I tried the first time though? That's uh, the way we told the story. Were you tried? Are you yeah. I was found guilty. The jury found me guilty. Yeah, so you were tried. Huh? So thirty years later, they can't come back at you. You already, you already um served your time or paid your dues to the fact. So, so in this first story, when he died, I got charged with attempted murder, and then. Or sorry, three months later, he died. So I got charged with 10 murder. I got found guilty. Then could I get charged with murder the first time? Mm -hmm. So 30 years later, I can't. But three three months later, I can't. I don't think you can. The what is the separation there? Why? Either Miss Scott or somebody else tell me what, what the difference is or a dissenting opinion. The 30 years later is not directly in, um, in what way? What is, what's the reason? Oh, okay. so I'll, I'll answer that. It was. Yep. The reason he had a heart attack in my story 30 years later is because the bullet caused damage to his heart, and it just took 30 years for that damage to build up into a heart attack and die. Yeah. So it might still be the cause. Did I cause his death? But for me shooting him, would he have died? Of that heart attack, I'm telling you no. Uh, that, that's up for debate in real life. But remember, we in this classroom, we have to we have to work in a vacuum sometimes. So I should just give you the answer, and, and we can't debate it. In this story, 100% he would have lived. His heart would not have given out 30 years later if not for the bullet that I shot. Can I now? I've done my time for the for the attempted murder. Can I be arrested for murder? No, it goes back. It goes back to law. Not ex post facto, but in this, I'm sorry. It is a different charge. We, I, I did my time for attempted murder. Yeah. We're still doing double jeopardy, guys. Yeah. So we're going to talk about double jeopardy in just a couple minutes, but I want to put that in your in your head because it gets to bring out perfect points. 
It was a different crime. So in this case, the story that I told you, uh, one, double jeopardy won't be a won't be a challenge because they're two different crimes. Two, we have to talk about the, the jurisdictions. Everybody has a different rule for this. In general, many, many jurisdictions have what's called a year and a day rule. Mm -hmm. If I do something to cause you harm, you die within a year and a day, then I could be charged with murder. I, regardless of whether or not I was charged with the attempt Maybe that trial just took long, a long time to go, or maybe they've been investigating for a year. There's a ton of reasons why I wouldn't necessarily be done with my time. Or maybe I shot and I did a, for some reason I got a, a cherry deal, I did a month in jail for assault with a deadly weapon. I, I pled down to assault with a deadly weapon and I did a month in jail. And then he dies four months later. That falls within the, what a lot of jurisdictions have, is the year and a day rule, then there's absolutely no problem with me getting arrested again, charged, convicted, and doing more time for murder. Because A, it fell in the time, and two, two different two different crimes. Assault with deadly weapon is what I was charged and convicted for. Murder is not what I'm going to be charged for in this case. Other jurisdictions have a three-year rule. California had a, a year and a day rule. It switched to a three-year rule. So uh, know your jurisdiction, but in general, there is a time frame in the jurisdiction, the prosecutor you know, body of that jurisdiction is going to allow you to upgrade those charges if additional harm is found in that person. So the causation has to be coupled with the idea uh, of being able to have a successful prosecution as well, because I don't think anybody in the classroom uh, denied the fact that 30 years later in that story, I was still the causation. But the debate is, was I criminally liable for that causation? So one more example of the reasonability, and this one comes straight from the book. Uh, the wife is having beef with her husband, because uh, they are. And she decides that the best way to take care of this beef is I'm, gonna, I'm going to poison my husband. So she cooks him a pie with uh, choose your poison in it. And he works late and he never gets a chance to have that pie. So she puts it in the fridge. And before he can eat that pie, she has a couple of visitors over. They see the pie, they eat the pie, and they die. Did she mean to poison those visitors? Yeah. Did she cause those visitors to be poisoned? Yeah. And just to make the story simple, they die. So we have a string of events. She meant to poison her husband, never did. She did poison end up poisoning the visitors. Was it reasonable to assume when she put poison into food and then put that food in the refrigerator that somebody could be harmed? Yeah. Yeah. Is there, there's a nexus between poisoning food and then somebody eating that poison food and dying. Yeah. If she had put poison in the pie right next to a bowl full of cherries that were not poisoned, and they pull out the pie and the cherries, they set the pie down, they start eating the cherries, and they start choking on the first cherry they ate, and they die. They pulled out that poison pie, but they never got a chance to eat it. She meant to, she meant to kill. We'll call it the husband. The husband goes in, pulls out that pair, the pie that she meant him, for him to die eating. He eats the cherries, he chokes on cherry, and he dies. He dies anyway. She tried to kill him, and he died. Is there a nexus between those cherries and her trying to poison him? Yeah. It wasn't reasonable for... She couldn't have reasonably assumed that he was going to choke on a cherry when she was poisoning that pie, even though the end result was the same. But we can, going back to the, the way we told the first time, we can reasonably assume that if I put poison in a pie and I have visitors over, that the visitors could be, that somebody could get harmed. And we didn't, just didn't see that it was going to be the visitors. In fact, that was, it wasn't just reasonable assumption. She planned for it to happen. We don't have a lot of moving parts in the story. She planned for somebody to for him to eat this pie and die. And there's somebody else ate the pie and died. So she knew exactly what was going to happen when Keo ate the pie. So she should have reasonably uh, been able to believe that harm was going to come. So is she criminally liable for those two deaths of her visitors? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because there was a criminal act, poison the pie, trying to kill her husband. And then she acted on, or a criminal thought, we, we had mens rea, I want to kill my husband. And we have actress Roy, she acted on it, she put the poison in there. And then that intent was transferred over to our visitors.
This is an interesting story in Ohio. I'll share it with you. So there's a pursuit, two suspects in the vehicle. A lot of officers chasing this, this car. Goes around a ton of time, chase them, chase them, chase them, chase them. Finally, uh, they get pinned into a location where they can't back out of, and all of a sudden a gunshot rings out from the, from the suspect's car, bang. And then all these cops start firing. They end up firing over 100 shots. But when, when it starts to see that the, the, uh, the danger has died down, one officer keeps on shooting, keeps going bang, 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 20 times after everybody else has stopped, keeps shooting, reloads, bang, bang, bang. It is, by comparison at least, more excessive than the rest of the officers believed it to be. The rest of the officers thought that the threat had stopped. This officer continued shooting, bang, bang, 20 times. Now we're going to find out as Paul, what Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story. First, the two people in the car died. Two suspects in the pursuit died. Second, there was no gunshot from the suspect's vehicle. It was a backfire because they, had, they were caught in a place where they couldn't back up and it caused a, a backup in the uh, exhaust and a backfire. Third, the officer violated the department policy. We're just going to stipulate that he violated department policy. And yes, that shooting was excessive. The other officers there were found reasonable in their shootings. That officer is now liable for those extra 20 shots. And these two people are dead. So those are that's our fact pattern that we have to discuss. Any questions on, on the facts? Okay. That officer was arrested. Arrested for the murder of these two people because they're now dead. He excessively shot. He violated the department policy. He uh, fired into a vehicle when there was no additional threat. And now they're dead. So we have a, a criminal act. He goes to trial. Right before trial starts, there's a motion by the defense to examine what we exactly what we've been talking that that com or the uh, convergence of a criminal act and a causation, somebody to cause that criminal act. Because when they do the autopsy on these two, they have 132 bullet holes in them, but they can't find one bullet hole that they can definitively say is this officer who shot the 20 extra rounds. Do we all agree that what those extra 20 rounds are wrong? Yes. Yeah. This department said it was. Can we probably agree that those 20 extra rounds are criminally wrong in what he did, either an assault with a deadly weapon, uh, uh, you know, assault with a, under the color of authority, whatever crime you want to come up with as shooting at somebody when they should. Yeah. There's a ton of there's a ton of laws that we can come up with. However, in this story, he was never convicted of that murder because what? Because they can't prove that any of those extra twenty bullets caused the death of those two people. It's reasonable to believe that they were probably dead anyway because there was over a hundred bullets fired at them. Yep. Yeah. All 20 of them could have been his. He could have put all 20 rounds in there and been the cause of both of them. But you can't. If you don't have that, that criminal act and somebody who caused that criminal act. So in this case, he wasn't being tried for uh, battery under color of authority, assault with a deadly weapon, all the, all the whatever uh, ancillary crimes we can come up with that the cops can be charged with for doing bad things. In this case, we're talking about murder and murder alone. So in this murder specifically, we need an act, or yeah, we need a criminal act of murder and somebody to be the cause of that criminal act of murder. Those two have to converge. And you can never find any of those rounds inside those two bodies to say that he is the cause, not of battery of the color authority, not of ADW, but he is not the cause of death, murder. We don't have a crime. If you don't have both halves of that circle converging, we have no crime. That, that case never went to trial. Not only was he not, not only was he found not guilty, he ended up never going to trial because the judge looked at those two convergences we're looking at today and realized, no, we may have a criminal act, but we don't have a person to be blamed for that criminal act. So we have no full definition of the word crime. No crime means no trial. Newt. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So, you talk about the bullet, the, the officers that stopped firing uh, prior the, the, in that first round, that first volley. I did that be up for, for discussion. Sure, I think we could say if we could find one of those officers whose round pierced off the, uh, a, a Bible organ, so we say definitively that this person's round killed that person there. So we have an act, we have a person to be blamed for the act. But do we have a criminal act to converge with that? When they were shooting yeah. while it's reasonable to believe that the officers are being shot at the point that the initial officers began firing, they believed they were being shot at. Was it reasonable to believe yeah. that somebody who ran from the police that that bar uh, had been engaged in criminality and then stopped, was pinned, and then it was sounded like a gunshot? Is it reasonable, not true, but is it reasonable to believe that the officer was firing in self defense? Yeah. So, was it, was it a crime to shoot at that point? Yeah. No, not. not not usually. I mean, we're going to add there's all these other facts, and it's always going to be up for debate, and you're always going to hear the news. Oh, they, they shot an unarmed person. But was it reasonable at that time? With the, the, the knowledge that they had at the moment they pulled the trigger, they thought they were being shot at. So we have somebody to blame for that death, but we don't have this other piece where the criminal act. And again, that's, that's me giving you all those facts. A lot of the rest of your life is going to be spent not having me up here giving you the, the facts. You're, you're just going to either be an investigator, piecing it together, or watching the news and hearing it. We talked about uh, the Breonna Taylor incident. We talked about, you know, we, we give, we, we're given the facts so we can make a decision. At the moment of acting, not all the facts, whether it be the police officer or Brianna's uh, boyfriend or, or male friend, uh, nobody in that situation had all, had all had all the answers, had all the facts. The officers are going in, trying to service, to affect a search warrant, believing that they're not going to be shot at because it usually doesn't happen. Her boyfriend is sitting in the house, believing that he can sit in the house and not have the door come crashing down. And if your door comes crashing down, you usually don't, ex the first thing you think of is, oh, they're probably serving a search warrant. It's cool. No, you think you're getting attacked. You think so everybody's acting on imperfect information in that situation. That's why in this class, in order to fully discuss uh, legal principles, I have to give you all the facts. Otherwise, we're just going to debate all day. We're like, oh, well, that, that shooting is good, that shooting is bad, or maybe maybe those extra 20 rounds are good, or maybe maybe it was within policy. I have to tell you, otherwise we won't come to a, to a conclusion. I'm telling you, the shooting I'm, is against policy. It's criminally liable for that shooting, but we have to discuss, is he criminally liable for the murder? But that that case that you just that you gave us a scenario for was totally um, um, civil, right? It was totally could be heard civil. Absolutely, could be heard civilly. In fact, I would I would venture to say that there is a good percentage of uh, officer involved shootings that end up in some sort of civil litigation. I couldn't tell you the you know, exact amount, but the the idea that a government is responsible for the death of somebody else is uh, oftentimes going to result in some sort of civil claim. So, harm. Good morning, sir. We talked about causation. Approximate cause, things like that. We've kind of covered that. Let's talk about the, the second step in that of the four prongs harm. We said earlier that harm doesn't necessarily have to be a medical issue, it doesn't have to be an injury where, where you seek treatment. Uh, I think I earlier in the week, it's not an owie, it's not, it's not something that hurts. It harm is a legal term where you've lost something. So we just talked about arson. If, uh, if your house burns down in an arson, You've been harmed in the either you've been physically injured or you've lost your property or your property is damaged. That's all that's a harm. Uh, the story with the pursuit. How if we call them the victims of murder, how were they harmed? Yeah, they literally got shot. If uh, the story I told a week or two ago where I took her keys, how was she harmed? I never touched her. 
Exactly. Loss of property. She she had something and now she doesn't. That's a harm. That's a, a, a new fact. And we talked about earlier today, we talked about victimless crimes. Give me a good example of what, what folks would call a victimless crime. Prostitution. Prostitution. That, that comes up a lot. Gambling. Gambling. Vices. Drugs. Sure. So then we need to figure out how some, and this is a victimless crime, how somebody can be harmed by that crime. You don't necessarily need, because otherwise it wouldn't be illegal. Nobody's being harmed. In theory, we shouldn't make it illegal as a society. Yeah, let's talk about prostitution. So someone came up first. I spent many, many years uh, investigating prostitutions. Uh, who's harmed? So let's, let's define prostitution. So we can be on the same play. Prostitution is, by definition, the agreement for a sex act for compensation. Compensation doesn't necessarily have to be money. Uh, it could be a sex act for a cheeseburger. It could be, in theory, a sex act for a ride someplace. A sex act for drugs, which is oftentimes the case. An exchange for, uh, for drugs, which is a compensation for uh, a sex act. Does that be intercourse? No, any, any sex act. Uh, by definition, does still have to be an act and not, uh, not a discussion or, or a show, if you will. So we're on the same page, a sex act for some sort of compensation. Either way, oh, I'm sorry, the agreement. So we have to make sure we, we clarify that. The agreement of a sex act for or for a compensation. Why is that important? Why is the agreement part important and not just exchanging a sex act for uh, for compensation? Three it was a gift. Sure. Uh, consent. The, the, the agreement is also uh, important for the investigative tool. Because as somebody who investigated narcotics, or excuse me, investigated prostitution for many years, I arrested many, many people who agreed to have sex in exchange for compensation. Does anybody in this classroom think that I ever actually had sex with these people? If the charge was the exchange of sex for compensation and not the agreement for sex for compensation, would I have ever been able to arrest somebody? No. It's an investigative tool. That's, the, that's why it's such a key uh, key element. All that being said, what is who is being harmed? Uh, well, in this case, we'll go to fairly uh, stereotypical: a, a male John and a female prostitute. Uh, who, and, and we'll say in this situation, it is a uh, street walking prostitute. So somebody engaging in on the boulevard, uh, soliciting cars and or, or men soliciting this this woman for sex. And, and we're also not going to we're going to stipulate the fact that this woman is actually a prostitute and not being trapped or anything like that. So she has the intent. She went out to the boulevard, said, "I'm going to make uh, some money today." And this gentleman went out to the boulevard and said. I'm going to have some fun today, and I'm going to uh, hire a process. So those two situations are, are facts. We don't need to, to argue those fact, fact patterns. Who is being harmed? Is, we'll start with the male. Is the male being harmed at all in, in that exchange? Yeah. In what way? I mean, he's being manipulated. Um, he's getting, you know, STDs, stuff. There's so many different factors that go harm to both parties. Sure, sure. But he's the one is who it initiated. reasonable? I'm sorry? He's the one who initiated the deal. So which one of them, in my story, neither one of those people in this story, I'm telling you, is a police officer. No, no curveballs. He negotiated an act of sex from her. She negotiated a price, and they both came to agreement for $50 for whichever sex act you'd like to, to throw in here. They both came to that agreement, and then they go to the alley and, and, and consummate that deal. Before they went to the alley, did they have an agreement for sex for compensation? Which one of them? She agreed. He, he never agreed to it, so was he sexually assaulted? I'm sorry? They both did. So if you don't believe that but they both had that, that agreement, then you have to believe that one of them didn't give consent and they must have been sexually assaulted. So if they both agreed, and that definition is the agreement of a sex act for compensation, then which one of them is guilty of prostitution? Both. 100%. Both of them. 
They are both guilty of the, of the violation of agreeing to have sex for money in this case. I want to, I want to play devil's advocate with that. Sure. Now, um, the John, Maddie, um, going out soliciting um, prostitutes. Happens many times. Um, I've seen that many times. Yes. yes. Um, now, you go home, the rent money's not there. The mortgage money's not there. The family gets home. The wife gets home. And that's exactly you both bring up very, very valid points that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to bring up, but you did my job for me. <laughs> so can we still call this a victimless crime? Is nobody being harmed? Yeah. Right. The, the fact we have to disagree. When I say it's nobody being harmed, then we disagree because somebody is being harmed. Now we have a victimless crime by definition because on a crime report, we're not listing anybody as the victim of prostitution. We have victims of battery. Whoever got punched in the face is a victim of battery. Whoever in the story where I'm shooting on the window, whoever got hit with a bullet, that was a victim of that uh, murder. Well, that was the AEW. Uh, John or Joey, whoever was in my house, and I, I, uh, I went to go shoot him, and he died 30 years later. He was a victim of that shooting. But when we list prostitution or drug use or gambling, on that arrest report, there is no space for who is the victim of that gambling, who is the victim of that prostitution. It just is. That, that crime exists because there's, there, we have a, the act, okay, we, we, I thought of mens rea, I thought about committing the act of prostitution, and then I either drove up or I walked on the sidewalk, whichever side you're looking at, and I engaged in that criminal act. But we just don't have a victim. So we still call it a victimless crime, but just because we have a victimless crime doesn't mean we have nobody being harmed by these crimes. And that's why these, these statutes are in place, in theory, because it betters society. These are societal crimes. So society is being harmed by a homeless encampment with open air drug use. Society is being harmed by having a bunch of Johns drive up and down in Los Angeles, Sepulveda Boulevard, Sepulveda Boulevard, looking for prostitutes or having a bunch of prostitutes. What about the prostitutes who not, aren't necessarily, they may seem like they're giving consent to these Johns, but behind the scenes, there is somebody who's trafficking them and forcing them into this, this trade so is she a victim of prostitution? Not necessarily, but she is a victim of human trafficking or a victim of pimping. Because what you see a lot of times on TV is this, this glorified version of a pimp. All a pimp is is just somebody who's forcing somebody else into the drug or excuse me, the sex trade and then taking all the proceeds. So that's what I, uh, I want to point out and make sure that we understand that we may have these victimless crimes that we don't literally have somebody to list as a victim of the crime. But it doesn't mean there's no harm. So we're still meeting that legal definition of a crime because somebody is being harmed, in this case, society. society. Principle of legality is our third aspect of a crime. Principle of legality. That's fairly simple. You can't commit a crime that isn't written down. There has to be something saying you can't do this. I know we talked about crimes of omission, where, it happened, where they say uh, that the definition of a crime of omission says that you cannot be held legally responsible or criminally liable for not doing something unless the law says that you have to do that thing. In the same way, the law says that you have to not do that thing. We'll go back to prostitution. There is a law on the books for most states, most jurisdictions that says you cannot exchange or have an agreement to exchange a sex act for compensation. It may be written 50 different ways in 50 different jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions may not have that agreement portion. Some jurisdictions may say it's the exchange of money for, for a sex act. A lot of jurisdictions have that agreement in there, that, those elements of that crime. But had it not been written down someplace and then somebody decided to engage and, and, uh, and agree to sex for money, they can't be arrested for that because there's no principle of legality there. What if, and I, you brought this up earlier, we're going to stick with prostitution today. There is no law against prostitution. We're going to rewind to, uh, to whenever that is, 1700s, 1800s, whenever it is we, we decided uh, that the, the, we started codifying our, our laws here in the United States. Come to the United States, it is the Wild West, and there is no codified law against prostitution. There's nothing that says you can't exchange or agree to exchange a sex act for money. 
And you do. And a lot of people do. And in doing so, it brings in, so we start seeing a lot of human traffickers. We start seeing a lot of pimps, and pimps are causing harm to the girls. And then I think you brought up STDs. There, there, there's a ton of different harms to society. Maybe drugs started coming in. And we realized, what's the root of all this? Oh, prostitution. We need to stop this. So we write down a law that says, okay, you cannot exchange, you cannot agree to exchange a sex act for compensation. And then they, they vote on it, and it's a law now. And so for the last year, these 12 guys have been doing it over and over and over. They've been engaging in what is now called prostitution. Can we go back and arrest them? Because now we have a law that wasn't when they did it, but now it's a law. But we know they did it. What they were doing was causing harm to society. They were, they were, caught, they were, they were part of the, the chain that led to human trafficking, narcotics, uh, harm to women, harm to society. They harmed society. And now it's illegal, so let's go and arrest them. Ex post facto law. Exactly right. Ex post facto. You cannot be arrested for a crime that was legal when you did it and is now illegal. In that same vein, not only can you not be arrested for a crime that was illegal back then, is in, or was legal back then, is illegal now, and you didn't continue doing it. Because that's the key portion of that. As long as you stop doing it once it becomes illegal, you're fine. If you continue now that it's illegal, yeah, <laughs> then you're just like any other person breaking the law. What about, and we're just going to create a, create a law, um, stealing. There's a ton of people stealing $400, uh, uh, $400 bills. Just going around, there's a huge rash of $400 bills there. And we're realizing that society is being harmed by that. And it's illegal. It's illegal to steal $400, right? So I keep seeing like uh, 100 people have been, we've arrested 100 people for stealing, stealing these $400 bills. And they're all, they all keep coming to jail, doing a year in jail, and then getting out. I'm tired of it. You know what? I'm going to petition to my, uh, uh, my representative. They're going to vote on a law. And now stealing a $400 bill is a felony. It's not a misdemeanor. It's voted on and it becomes true. Now, no longer is stealing $400 a misdemeanor. It is now a felony. And these guys that stole $400, screw them. Now they're in jail for a felony, right? No. Not only is ex post facto breaking the law when it wasn't illegal, you also cannot enhance that law when you're already in custody for something that was not enhanceable before. If it was a misdemeanor when you did it, it's always going to be a misdemeanor for that specific crime. But the next time you steal a $400 bill, then what? Felony. Exactly. You cannot enhance a crime that has already been committed, and you cannot legal illegalize an act that was not that was not illegal when it was committed. That's how I expose that. We talked about double jeopardy. Uh, video here in a second. Uh, in general, what is double jeopardy? Being tried twice for the same crime by the same body. If, as a law enforcement officer, you violate somebody's civil rights by uh, shooting them unlawfully, that, that's the only we talked about the other two. If he had been found uh, guilty of that murder, we had taken away some of those fact patterns and we were able to show that he killed them unlawfully and he committed murder. If he was tried and found guilty there at the uh, the state level, he could also be tried and found guilty at the federal level for violating civil rights or you know some sort of murder murder uh, related crime because those are two different prosecutorial bodies. It goes to it's so close and so close and double jeopardy. Uh, right. So we'll break it down. Ex post facto being you can't if, if it was legal then, it's always going to, that act is always going to be legal. That the act that you committed. It's always going to be legal. If you do it again, if you do a new act, it's going to be illegal. Double jeopardy being, if I if I get convicted, or more uh, more recently, if I get found innocent, not guilty of a crime, I can't be retried for that crime. New evidence comes, comes to play. But I can be retried by a second body. 
Uh, the example is there's a guy who went on a honeymoon with his wife and allegedly murdered her in Australia, I believe it was. Right. So he ended up, you know, uh, doing a little bit of time for, for some crime there. He came back to the United States, they decided to try him in the United States. Uh, and they were able to show that they were doing that because they're trying for a slightly separate crime. Because uh, you know, he planned, they, they're trying for the, the planning of the murder versus the, the commission of the murder. So that's where there's some real gray area when it comes to the double jeopardy. And that's what I want to show you this video all about. And, and it, it, there's such nuance in, okay, technically, you know, the, the officer is the termination pursuit. He gets, if he'd been found not guilty of the, the crime of, of murder, he went to trial. And in this case, if the jury found him not guilty of the murder, what about trying him again for assaulting with a deadly weapon? And if he gets found innocent there, then maybe we'll try him for shooting at an inhabited vehicle. If he found him innocent there, maybe we'll try, we'll, we'll arrest him again and we'll try him for shooting and firearm inside city limits. Like we're just, those are all different crimes, and they don't necessarily fall within double. They don't fall under the, the auspices of uh, double jeopardy. Is that a as a prosecutorial manager or body? Is that a crummy way to do business? Yeah. All right. Without cause, harm, principles of legality, and the last thing we're talking about is necessary attendant circumstances, and that is just the ways that things can be legal for some folks and not legal for others. The there could be. Uh, it's illegal to drink alcohol if you're under 21, but you have to be under 21 to do that. So that's a, a that would fall into that category of necessary attendant circumstances. It is illegal to, it could also increase a crime, not just make something illegal, but it can increase the crime. So uh, sexual battery is uh, oftentimes a misdemeanor, but sexual battery with restraint is a felony in some jurisdictions. If, if you do this additional thing, this necessary attendant circumstances in play, then the crime can be increased. So uh, if you look at page 98, it'll give you a good chart showing you exactly uh, the different categories in which these circumstances can come in. It could be the capacity to resist. It could be whether or not somebody's on drugs or not, their mental capacity. It could be somebody's age. Elder abuse cannot be a crime against somebody who's 21 years of age. It has to be in whatever jurisdiction, 65, 55, whatever the jurisdiction says, but you have to meet that, that age requirement for to be uh, a necessary attendant. Any questions? All right, enjoy your holiday.